I'm in the big leagues, told him don't miss me Ballin' like Houston, ayy, feelin' like Whitney I need a bag, bruh, send it through quickly I'm making his dog, like I'm in the big leagues Told him that I gotta go, dog. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Set Connects Cannabis Entrepreneurial Dialogues this is your host, Danny our mission is to create spaces for people of color, brands of color, and minorities in the cannabis industry to be able to educate and empower our communities through storytelling, experiences, and representation. Make sure to subscribe to YouTube at Said Connects. Follow us on Instagram at CED underscore connects. Right there. Right, or normally it's right there, huh? It's normally right there, right there, right there. Um, for all the updates, for all the episodes that are coming out, and... You know, thank you guys for, for tuning in. Shout out to all the guests that have been here so far. Um, we've had we've had a, quite the lineup, and today is no difference. Uh, we've had a few people reach out about who's the man behind the cameras, who is the one that's that's putting all this together. And so we thought, you know what? Let, let's go ahead and let's put the face to the camera. Um, and so we got Steven in the building. What is up, Set Connects? What is up, Danny? Thank oh, you for having filthy me. Oh, that's filthy in the filthy. building. Stephen J is filthy. Doing good, man. Sheesh. It's a What's Thursday. Up? It is a Thursday. What's we up? grinding, man. We grinding. Yeah, you know, we got to make Just to let happen. everyone know this wasn't planned, but I stepped in. We stepped in. We're getting it done because we are committed to delivering content. That's all I'm saying. That's right. That's right, man. But as always, and as every episode comes out, we would like to find out more about you, bro. So share with us a little bit about your upbringing. What was cannabis like in your household growing up? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I grew up in a, so I'm third generation Mexican-American um, okay. to the South Bay of, of LA. I was born and not born in Torrance, raised in Wilmington. So, All right. you know, oh, okay. born and raised in Wilma. the hood. Yeah. We must. We must. <laughs> so, we must. Uh, I was blessed. My parents ended up shipping me to uh, school in Palos Verdes. I graduated high school from Rolling Hills Preparatory School. Rolling Hills Preparatory? Okay. Yeah. That's not, uh, what's that other school up there? Um, There's Chadwick up there. No, which is really but big. the other one, it's I know there's PV. Is PV and Peninsula. Peninsula. Yeah, yeah. That's the those are both public high schools. I have, I have homies that went to both of them. Yeah. So. I remember we used to play football against those cats all yeah. the fucking time. CIF. They got, you know, they got good League. resources. That's why they get far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I grew up in a very conservative household, born and raised in the church. Um, and when I was, so I grew up with cannabis being the devil's lettuce, like, yeah. you know, my dad would scare me of drugs. My mom would scare me from drugs. Um, so I believed in all of the propaganda. I believed in all of the bad stigma. Um, and when I was 15, I got diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, which is a bone tumor. It was in my left ankle. Um, you know, I was, it was a weird situation cause I didn't have pain in my ankle. It just looked like it was swollen. Like I just kept spraining it, sprained it, took a week off, sprained it again. In Did football. you play sports or anything before that? Okay. Yeah, I played, I was a tri-sport athlete. I played uh, baseball, soccer, and football. Um, so that's kind of how I was blessed to go to the, the school. And uh, I made up 2% of the minority population. Oh, yeah, yeah, representing. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. Um, yeah, I was 15 years old. Got uh, one day, I went down to football practice and I lost feeling from the left part of my toes to my hip socket couldn't heal couldn't feel feel shit it was i thought i broke it i was like cool i'm done spraining my ankle i could i could like heal now i ended up going to urgent care because the pain didn't go away the pain didn't subside i took meds i took whatever and the pain was still you know 10 out of whatever yeah and so i went to urgent care do you got, remember what like your parents was like thinking or saying at the time to you oh we were all like cool it's broken oh, because okay. everyone was tired of me like <laughs> playing yeah. and then spraining my ankle okay playing and then like oh steven's in he's out he's in he's out like my cousin not my cousin my coach was calling me a pussy he was like why are you pussyfooting <laughs> shit steven and i was just like and it didn't it didn't help so like i'm bald now but uh when i was 15 i had long hair i'd surf her hair i surfed every morning in the summer <laughs> So like I would take off my my football helmet and like whip my hair and then put it back on every time. They called me Barbie. So like obviously yeah, sensitive subject. <laughs> but uh, so you know, 15 years old, I go to urgent care and the urgent care doctor takes X-rays, does some blood work, um, and he goes, you know what? I'm just gonna send you to this doctor. He didn't tell us any information. Sent me to a uh, orthopedic specialist. Okay. Specialist looked at my X-rays and was like, yeah, you. This is definitely a tumor. 
He goes, I'm not even going to mess with you. I'm going to send you directly to the doctor who wrote the book on bone tumors. Um, so that was my surgeon. Uh, his name is Dr. Eckhart. He's retired now. But I went, checked in like the day before Thanksgiving. I didn't check in. I just went to the hospital. They were like, you know, we need to run a CAT scan, a PET scan, an MRI, a biopsy, Damn. blood work. So oh, I got nine. in. I checked in. And I remember like I'm in a gown at 8 a.m. I was going out of the hospital at 1130. So I went boom, 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 boom. Like just test after test after test. I was supposed to, this was the day before Thanksgiving. They were like, oh, we're going to, it was two days before Thanksgiving. They're like, oh, we'll call you after the holiday. Day before Thanksgiving, we get a call. And they're like, hey, it's, it's cancer. You need to check in after Thanksgiving. And you're, you're going to be prepared for chemotherapy. And you're going to meet with the doctor and oh, see what everything is like. What was your thoughts immediately getting that? going into the holidays with family coming in like what paint that picture what was the, all the, the emotions going through with all that uh, emotions were super intense it was been the only time that i've ever seen my dad fall to his knees and cry like every like you know parents and i'm parent now it was like you 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 blame yourself for everything and as yeah. we've seen guests like you know as a parent role you're supposed to protect you're supposed to provide right and so my parents feel like they couldn't protect me but it yeah. was really like i'm blessed because i was i'm born in 94 so to me i was i was raised with cancer being a disease but it wasn't the end like i know multiple people who survived cancer i know multiple people who had cancer before that before okay um it's weird though because my grandfather died a year before that due to cancer but he oh, smoked shit. for oh, okay. 60 years and was like on his way out, right. God bless his soul. So I was like, fuck it, like, let's do what we gotta do. Check in, I get a portacath put into my body, I get all more scans, more blood work, and, and like, they kind of lay out what they're gonna do. Uh, I had Ewing sarcoma, so it's a very intense and very rare cancer. Only 2% of all bone tumors are Ewing sarcoma. Um, and it's local for six months, or it's systemic within a matter of like What's 36 hours. So what does that mean? So. My tumor was located in my ankle. So literally, if you looked at my scans, it was like from the middle of my shin down all my whole foot was cancerous, all had cancer cells. And then up into like the front of my shin, like about three, four inches up, not the back, but just the front, like all cancerous. Uh -huh. And essentially that was where the tumor was growing out of. So it was either local or it was systemic. And I mean, once it's systemic, you can't do anything. You're damn near battling stage four cancer. So I went through four rounds of chemotherapy right then and there and uh, ended up in March of 2010 getting my left leg amputated below the knee. And the reason for that is the doctor was like, you know, we can we can keep your leg, but you're going to go through so much radiation and so much trauma to that residual limb. It's going to be useless. And then in re reality, the necrosis, meaning how dead the, the tumor is going to be, is going to be around like 80 percent. I'm like, damn, eighty percent that is the cancer might be gone. That's a big, that's a big risk to gamble. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, well, what's the other option? They're like, below the knee amputation. I was like, oh, I don't know what that means when you say it like that. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? And they were like, yeah, this is what we'll do. And they explained everything. And my my dad was there, my mom was there, and we, I just like hopped on my phone. I'm 15 years old. Like, I'm gonna Google some shit. So I Googled amputee athletes like does that exist is that a thing because at that whole point sports was my entire life yeah um during high school like a big theme was like football saved my life i found mm -hmm. out about cancer because of football what drove me back to recovery was football i played every year of high school football even going through cancer losing my leg um i played with a regular walking prosthetic my junior year and then senior year i continued to play out the whole thing really? obviously i'm jumping around yeah. but um so i went through Four rounds of chemotherapy, got my leg amputated, and then I completed 10 more rounds of chemotherapy. Um, and that was that shit was hard. It's rough. I don't wish cancer upon anyone. I don't wish anyone to lose a limb. Um, but you know what? Like, for the most part, I handled it very well. I mean, I'm young. I was young. Yeah. So, like, typically, you and young kids can overcome anything. Sure. Um, which is what is fucked up is I lost, like at least 30 people that were very close to me due to cancer, due to kids. Lost my best friend, Nick Hurtado. I lost a few friends, uh, a young female by the name of Nicole, young female by the name of 
uh, Caitlin, and it was it was rough, man. You're just watching all these people around you die. From, <laughs> from like the from relationships you started building while in chemo, while in chemo, while in the hospital. So like through chemotherapy, um, I I was launched into the nonprofit sector. Um, I was 15, 16. I was introduced to this organization called the Sunshine Kid Organization. Um, I have it actually tattooed right here. I don't know, look for the camera, you're editing it, so make sure you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so that is an organization dedicated to children fighting cancer. And uh, they took, they take kids out of the hospital that are either in the middle of chemotherapy, post chemotherapy, whatever, and put them all on an all expenses paid trip. I mean, I did a local one my very first time. They took us to Disneyland, took us to Knott's, took us to Catalina. All expenses paid, top of the line treatment, stayed at the best hotels. And yeah. it's all because, and what was really helpful for me at 15 years old is, so I had no hair. I didn't have eyebrows. I weighed 260 pounds. I lost my left leg. And everyone in that organization just wanted to love you for who you are. They didn't care what you looked like. They didn't give a fuck what you were going through. They just wanted to love you. And that was the best thing that I could have done. And so, you know, talking about the organization, talking about how it helped me, I ended up getting a spot to be a spokes kid. So I, you know, went to Orlando, San Diego, New York, uh, multiple different golf courses, telling my story, talking about the organization and saying how it helped. So that really gave me this background of nonprofit work, understanding, oh, this is the business, understanding, oh, people can write this off. I see why you have all these big donors. I see why there's all this different community and it's a great cause. Like you're helping children fighting cancer. Yeah. Um, it was amazing. So that was my experience, but going back to cancer, at uh, 16 years old, I got a chance to experience with Miranol. Um, I was in a lot of pain. So some people have different reactions to chemotherapy. Some people, you know, um, get very sick and throw up. Me, I felt hot. Like, I felt hot all over my body. Like, I was in an oven. Like, I, they put ice packs all over me. So that's like, again, not a bad reaction. That was just my reaction. So I... I was having a terrible experience and I was like, I need something that can, that can do it. And they're like, Oh, well you can try this. So I took Marinol. It's an FDA approved version of cannabis. It's synthetic. And that was, that was terrible. I took 25 milligrams and it was not a high. It was, it's not a high that I have now, whether I'm smoking, whether I'm having an edible, whether I'm dabbing, yeah. it's not that it's, it's, it's bad. You're groggy. You're ang You're angry. You're uncomfortable. You're again. And it's not just like, that's your first time having cannabis. Like I look back on it and I'm like, no, that's not, it's not right for anyone to take. Like, I don't oh. know. I don't know why they approved that, but, yeah. um, cancer was like a big part of being 16. And then I also got thrown into the disabled community. Um, you know, have made amazing relationships and have friends that are Paralympians, friends that compete in do tour for skateboarding, friends that, you know, our uh, track Paralympians, the first Paralympian was a snowboarder. That's why I was like in my head trying to list them. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I say my life has been a blessed life. Um, I've had some tragedy, but it made me who I am today. And because of that, I feel like I'm a great cannabis activist and, you know, a medicinal cannabis patient by the definition. Um, Did you go through like therapy and stuff? Not Not like physical, but like mental therapy for like during the during no, like no to time. both no to both no? really <laughs> no to both i don't recommend it everyone go to therapy i love therapy i'm in therapy now but <laughs> fucking go to therapy guys uh no i didn't go through therapy and i didn't deal with it and you know when i started therapy in my adulthood at 24 i realized oh shit there's some stuff you need to unpack there yeah. bud <laughs> yeah dude, that's what was, that was the first thing i thought of but i was like i'm not gonna stop you from talking right now no, yeah, but yeah. i was just like thinking like no that's real you, so like so so here's the reality i'm 15 years old i get pulled at uh, 15 years old you're learning how to drive you get your permit yeah you're your sophomore in high school you think you know the shit like me i was a playing football and like just getting drunk and hanging out with girls like that's right. all i cared about at 15 and i think yeah. cannabis not cannabis i think cancer changed my life because i was going down a, a path that i know now is not something i want for me right. um but i got pulled out of school because your immune system's down when you're going through chemo chemo if you don't know anyone doesn't know chemotherapy is poison chemotherapy is entered into your body and is meant to kill all cells yes it's meant to kill cancer cells but it kills 
all cells. And I was on such an intense chemotherapy. I had to get a portacath. So portacath is like, imagine a mini, uh, a mini tin or aluminum volcano. Like very small, but it looks like a volcano. Uh-huh. They put it in your chest. They put it in your chest, and then they access with a needle in through your chest into the little silver volcano, and then that goes directly into your heart, and then that pumps it out to the rest of your body. Oh shit! But the chemotherapy that I was on was so bad that it couldn't touch your skin, or it would burn you. And that was one that would literally be accessed into my chest. So like. I'm doing this for the camera. This is a hole in my chest. My chest goes in about, I'd say about like three quarters of an inch because of that's where they put my first portacath. There was an issue with that. <laughs> um, Dang, when you like get your like Iron Man shit. No, no, straight up. Like no bullshit. Like yeah. that's what I, as 15 years old, that's I was like, okay, cool. This is, this is what it is. This shit is keeping me alive. Yeah. Like, like it's poison, but this is the safe space for this poison. That's going to help me get back to where right. I need to be. And again, I, I was 15, but I was very... Conscious. conscious with whatever was going into my body. I knew my meds. I knew what I was taking. There's multiple times where I told nurses, I'm not supposed to get that till tomorrow. Please check, please check your report. And like, you have to. And it, uh, it forced me to grow up. Like I made the decision to cut my leg. It wasn't like, like my mentality was if this tumor on my leg is trying to kill me, if my leg is trying to kill me, get the fuck off. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like disrespectfully, and, respectfully get right. off my body. And was your parents trying to stray you from, from that decision when my, my made it? No, 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 no. They didn't try to okay. stray it at all. But like, you know, my, my mom and dad, I, I say are like warriors of faith, warriors of Christ. And like, they pray and they pray and they pray. And like my dad to this day prays that my leg's going to grow back. And I'm like, yo, it doesn't work like, like that, but I'm going to, I'm going to accept right, those <laughs> fucking prayers yeah, all day. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Not blocking any blessings at all. But, um, yeah, man, like it was, that's a little, a little bit about it. And, um, me growing up, I wasn't until I was playing rugby, uh, when I was 18 years old and I would get out of practice and have to empty my my socket. So there's like a liner you put on your residual limb and then that liner goes into a socket. So I was playing um, U19 rugby, very competitive. And after practice, I would take off my leg and open it, like dump it out and there'd be blood, like just a lot of fucking blood being poured out. Um, and, my, and I would just pop, pop Advil, pop ibuprofen, like Skittles, dude, like whatever it was, like it was normal to me. And I played with a bunch of Pacific Islanders, Samoans, oh, Tongans, yeah. and they fucking smoke before practice. They smoke after practice. Yeah, and they if smoke it's not, when <laughs> if it's not smoking, they're drinking cava. The facts. So like, <laughs> so like one day they were like, and I was again, I was trying to mesh with the team more and be yeah. more involved. And like, you want to come smoke? I was like, and they're like, your ass needs it. And I was like, yeah, let's let's go, let's go smoke. And so okay. I, I smoked out of a, a Swisher, and then from there it kind of I started smoking with them regularly, yeah. and that kind of started everything. But I didn't get into like consuming cannabis till I was eighteen years old, over eighteen, and I did that for my dad. I was like, you know what, like, like he he wouldn't be like extremely pissed off at me if I did drugs, sure. but he was just like, you know what, like please at least know what you're doing and be smart. And I was like, you know what? I waited until I was 18. This is something I want to do. And then when I be- jumped into the cannabis industry, he was like, oh, I guess you really like it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Where you, you started smoking at 18, Pops finally was convinced that, you know, since you're in the industry, um, talk to me about that start with, it kind of just went from yeah. real quick. Like you just kind of just, through in you're in the industry, but how did that happen? Of course. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm smoking and from the time being 18 to, uh, I'd say like 24, I did ran, not random jobs, but I was like, did three years as a personal trainer, did two years working background acting and then worked three years as a retail manager as I was background acting. And so like, um, I was just trying to network, meet as many people as possible, build my resume, have something that's solidified and then also just have fun. Um, but I was smoking every single day since I started smoking for the most part, I smoked every single day. I mean, yeah, I got the full little stoner kit and the Pringles can and everything, the roller, the grinder. Yeah, dude, it was, uh, I went full force. Like this was before jumping in, but, um, so I'm consuming cannabis. I'm like understanding that this helps me. Like, I know that 
like what helped me was Nug Life. And when we met, his whole thing was like, no lazy stoners. Like, no, it, it doesn't matter. Like, if you're doing that, you, you got to be productive. You're smoking, we're doing shit. We're smoking, we're making moves. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not a lazy stoner. And that kind of been able, that was what forced me to be able to operate, enjoy cannabis, get all my responsibilities done, but not feel stressed. So I just want to bring it up to bring the point out that I am in pain 24 seven. There's not a moment that I'm not in pain. So really? people have to realize if you get a limb amputated, your nerves just get cut off. Like you're, there's no ending of nerves. There's no sewing huh. of nerves. I'm fucking right. whoosh, whoosh, like, and they're still there. So my body sends neuro like fucking, uh, whatever neuro transmit transmit whatever it transmits it pain. pain it yeah. transmits a lot lots of pain so uh, <laughs> that's crazy it do, is phantom leg a thing yes it's a real thing um typically people have a lot of phantom limb pains when that limb has gone through a lot of trauma but like i said for me i didn't go through a lot of trauma it wasn't painful like did you did you see the process or were you out I was out and okay. you know, this is a cool story. It's kind of fucked up. I think it's cool. But when I woke up, I woke up like, like 20, 15 minutes after surgery. Okay. I was in such a significant amount of pain. I could have sworn that someone had my ankle stuck a, a railroad spike through it, put it in a fire and then started just twisting it and just twisting it. That's the visual pain that I can tell you my, my left leg was on, was over a fire, like a pig mm -hmm. just fucking being turned, but like turned aggressively. Cause that shit was still on me. <laughs> it was not like a, a nice one. So that was like, and I, they were like, Oh, give me, give him more morphine, knock his ass out. Like, so that's been by far the most pain I've ever had. And again, I didn't experience that, but I could tell you that's probably what it fucking felt like. Right. Um, and then when I first saw my leg after surgery, I got so scared took the covers off of my leg. It was in a full bandage. And it was like, uh, have you seen Spy Kids? No. Okay. Well, there's a thing called the thumb men. It's like a bunch of little thumbs, okay. but it looked like a fucking thumb that was wrapped in like, like uh, yeah. gauze. And when they unwrapped it, it was literally like, like this. This is the best way I can say it was just... No. Just off, not even a nub. Like I have a nub now. We have a nub now. Okay. <laughs> and this is like a fresh, like fucking. I don't know. It was, it was oh. scary. And then you see staples across it, and like it was just it. It. I'm over it now, but sure. that was very traumatizing for me. That's insane. It's insane, and it was on me. Like like typically, you're like, oh, I can't look. Like I was like, oh my god, this is all I can look at. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was uh, it was wild, but. I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to close that no. up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's crazy. Because you know what? It's crazy to say too, but and my people think I'm weird about Just it. Just say it. Yeah. But there's this site on Instagram mm -hmm. called uh, Medicopedia. Yeah, and it's like a bunch of, a bunch traumatic, of like traumatic shit. Yeah, shit. Dude. I I follow it because I I'm like one of these. Like, yeah. <laughs> I feel you. I can't help but look, but I don't want to look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's insane. If you guys haven't seen that page, just be careful. A lot of, lot of red shit. A lot, a lot of, of red. red. <laughs> a lot of red. Um, but all right, let's, let's bring that shit back. Yeah, getting into the industry. So I'm like being a medicinal patient, understanding. And a big part of me at that time, like I was, I was trying to do music and like pursuing music business, but I was networking and I was understanding. Oh, right, right, right. I was understanding how to nurture relationships and where that can get you and like what I bring to the table. That's essentially what all relationships are is like, here, this is what I bring. Maybe I can yeah. help you, but I'm not going to ask anything from you right now. But I'm going to just, I'm going to bring what I have to the table to everyone's table. Yeah. And, and if they welcome me, they welcome me. If they don't, they don't. But I wanted to get politically involved. Um, if you don't know, for disabled community, there's a big need for disabled lawyers. And there's a big need for activism. And, like, you know, something as basic as this parking lot doesn't have an accessible ramp. This isn't, isn't accessible for anyone. Or this is only accessible for this people. So wanting to get politically involved with something that I knew I, I had. And then I had this nonprofit experience. And I was like, well, I could definitely go work for a nonprofit. Like, I, I, I get mm -hmm. it. And so I was, uh, I was lucky enough. I landed first. I landed an internship with 1500 or Nothing Sound Academy. So I was, you know, pursuing that music thing. And then on my second week of the internship, I got a call 
Um, and they were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm at my internship. They're like, we're going to interview you right now. I was like, okay. And they're like, what do you know about weed? I was like, I smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I'm not going to bullshit you. Like, I don't believe I'm a big believer in not faking it till you make it. If you fake it and you see someone that's a shot caller and they call your bullshit, they will tell everyone else that you are full of bullshit. Yeah. I'm not a fan of faking it till you make it. So I was like, I, I don't know, but I could fucking learn. I was like, I could learn better than the best of them. Mm -hmm. And then they, they interviewed me like, oh, what is your nonprofit experience? What is your public speaking like? What is your education like? Yada, right. yada, yada. What is your whole story? And then I landed in, uh, from that little preliminary call while I was at my internship, I got offered to interview for an internship with the Long Beach Collective Association. And I sat down and they kind of explained what the association does and they explained what the needs were. And they just hired Pam at that time. And they were like, you know, we, we want to expand. We need someone to do outreach. We need someone who can be in the streets, someone who can talk to political figures, someone who understands what's going on. But number one, you have to understand Long Beach cannabis better than anyone. Um, and at this point, at this at this interview, it was an unpaid internship. They're like, you do this for three months. See if you like it. See if you can do it. What so, year was this? 2018. Okay. Because I've been with the organization. July will be five years with the LBCA. Okay. As, a, as like a staff. And so. Um, so just a little bit after legal rec. Yeah. So rec, like rec. in Long Beach, I got brought on right after they, like, no, right during during the memorandum was ending to allow adult use sales. So before that, it was only medi uh, medicinal in Long Beach, and sure. then it went to adult use through their relationships with um, the, the mayor and stuff like that. So I can, let me break down what the LBCA is, and I'll yeah. give my whole little pitch. So um, the LBCA is the Long Beach Collective Association. It is a nonprofit trade association that is dedicated to fighting for safe access and uh, making sure the land in Long Beach is safe for philanthropy. We are a collective of business owners. So you have to have a license to be a voting member and you have to have a license in Long Beach. So the a license in cannabis? In cannabis, gotcha. yes. So okay. you can either, our members consist of retailers, cultivators, manufacturers, distributors, laboratories, and then our ancillary members are like, uh, you know, accessory members are marketing agencies, security companies, payment processors, lawyer groups, now, stuff like that. Now, do these licensee holders need to be licensed members in the city of Long Beach or can they come from anywhere in the state? So we accept all members, but if you're a voting member, you have to be in Long Beach. So um, a little bit more about the LBCA is that the LBCA was formed in 2009 and it was formed when they the city first allowed cannabis retail. Okay. Um, it was the collective model. And then they had to bind together because they realized not the city's an enemy, but the city isn't working with us. So we have to work together to maintain this, this, this area to compete. We're all business owners. We're all going to compete, but we can't compete if the city takes this, this industry away, if it, it doesn't make safe practices. And so, um, in 2012, there was a, an issue. It was a pack versus long beach case. It was a pack of people sued the city of long beach and said, what you're doing by having cannabis dispensaries is federally illegal. This issue went all the way up to California Supreme court. The Supreme court said the California Supreme court said, you're right. Shut it down. Long beach. So on August 12, 2012, all of the 24 dispensaries in Long Beach at that time had to shut their doors. And then they turned into a campaign headquarter. They started getting signatures and garnishing signatures. And they, they you know, knock, knocked on precincts. They had car washes. They did everything they can do. They had literally desks signed up and they were registering people to vote so they can, they can get this issue passed. They spent about $1,000 to do a voter-led ballot initiative. They took it to the city and the city came back and said, 18 of those signatures are invalid. Do it again. They had 32,000 signatures. You have to do it again. They said, do it again or not do it again, but like, nice try. It, it didn't pass. So by, by saying do it again, it's like, it didn't pass. Good luck. Not happening now. That same time that they were trying to get this voter led ballot initiative on the ballot, the city of Long Beach passed a tax ordinance saying, we're going to tax cannabis 25% if this, if this passes. We're, they just set it up. They were just like, we need to be able to monetize this before we even, like, what if the people do it? 
If the people do it, if it's a voter-led ballot initiative, the politicians can't do anything. It has to be changed by the people. Oh, so they, they got prepped. They got prepped. And so, um, and it's crazy because our now executive director, Mr. Steve Neal, he served on the council in 2010. And he was very involved. And the reason why he became a supporter, uh, Mr. Neal, he was a council member in the 9th District of Long Beach. And he sat down with a hundred people that lived in his district that all were medical cancer, uh, medical cannabis patients and all advocated for the plant and needed the plant. And from that moment, he goes, it's more than just marijuana. He goes, this, he goes, if it's a hundred people in my district, imagine how many people are throughout the rest of the country, not the country, but the, the city, the city, the city. Yeah. like, and these are people who are willing to come forward with their cannabis use and with their, their cannabis activism. There's a lot of right. people who are still in the green closet in 2023. Um, yeah. So that was how I got in. And then, you know, from there, my very start of the internship, all I did damn near six hours was read the city website, read, learn how to read regulations, learn how to read ordinances. Cause there was, there's a learning curve and you know, I, again, if someone called with a question, I had to answer, I had to be able to find it. And I completely engulfed myself. It was, uh, someone told me this advice. You're like with cannabis, it's either all or nothing. And I was like, Oh shit. And they're like, no, nah, you dump, you jump in and you over educate yourself or you don't do it. And so I, I jumped in. And I still, to this day, am a student of the game where everyone knows we're still researching cannabis where we can't even properly research it now, but there's more and more studies to come. And anyone who says they're an expert, anyone who says they're a master, anyone who says this, um, is just full of ego, but you know, we got a bunch of ego in this space right now. Not, not this space, not this space, but, but this, <laughs> but this space. <laughs> that's dang. That's. That's a lot, man. And yes, so oh, I, I, I just, I just learned like, yeah. you know, learned how far we had to be away from a school. How is the tax structure shut, uh, set up? Why doesn't this not make sense? And like, you know, I've been with the association for five years now. Um, I have seen a lot of my members go through a lot of pain, lose millions of dollars, lose their businesses. And they're all great people. Um, and I just think that all cannabis entrepreneurs are some of the bravest entrepreneurs around. And it not only takes guts, but it takes cojones and huevos and it takes all it, of it. It takes a little bit of insanity, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, does. operating in the cannabis space is um, it's all risk and reward. That's like what weed has always been about, a risk and yeah. reward. And I and, you know, I see I see it. But right now it, it's, it's about survival. It's about bleeding. And it's been about bleeding since I almost stepped in. And like people don't understand that with pot, there will always be politics. They, they're, they're, they're fucking married and they're going to be married. And like, here's, here's something that's messed up. And like, you know, a lot of people are super optimistic about the space. And like, you know, I deal with legislation. I deal with taxes. I deal with stuff that affects businesses, not community members. I'm, we're not advocating for the community. We're advocating for business owners, but like we're dealing with taxes right now. Every local municipality has their own tax structure. Yeah. On top of that, then you get taxed at the state level. Yep. And the state isn't going to change their taxes for a very long time or for a lot of money. And then on top of that, once it's federally, the Fed is going to want to tax it at least 15%. So right now you're at a, at a state level, you're being taxed 40% high ballpark, but ballpark on sure. your purchase at a retail store. And this is a compounding tax that is from grower to manufacturer to distributor to retail then onto you as as the consumer and it's not going to get any better and we talk about tax reform but you know no one is on the same page there's small groups that are on the same page i'm very blessed that the lbca is on a state um a state committee that is pushing these issues but that's why i'm also saying like this it's real like and the only people who are going to be able to operate in this fucked up industry is big cannabis, not big cannabis, big tobacco and big pharma. Only two people. And they're coming. They're already here. They're not as present, but they've been here for a while and they they don't give a fuck that you're that you've given your entire life savings to this cannabis yeah, industry. Yeah, they're just kind of just sitting back and like letting, They're like, "Oh, you fix it. it. You yeah. go fix uh -huh. it. Go fix it. it Do done. all your work. Like, yeah. we're we'll support you from back here. We're not going to give mm -hmm. you any money, but you're doing a great job. I'm going to give you a thumbs up, yeah. pat on the back. I'm going to yeah. reshare your Instagram post, but I ain't going to do shit. I'm not going to show up to the meetings. I'm not going to show up to city council. I'm not going to go they lobby at the state to. like exactly. They don't need to. Like 
It's so getting done. And that's, again, that's where, like, it's fucked up because there's so many people who are like, oh, I'm, I'm about weed. I'm about cannabis shit. I'm a hustler. I'm like this. And it's like, yo, you can't have that without the people putting in the footwork. And you don't know how politicians think. You don't know how to move taxes. Like, we've lowered the, the LBCA has lowered taxes in the city. We're going to try to do it now for a twice time but we currently lowered it back in 2019 by a total 15 percent across three different licenses we lowered it from six percent tax down to one percent tax that was across laboratories manufacturing and distros that allowed businesses to operate that allowed businesses to hire more people um and without those changes nothing is gonna be like in business, you look at the, the bottom line. That is right. that is business. That is entrepreneurship. If your bottom line doesn't make sense, if your bottom line is always staying red, it's not a business model, fam. It's it's a it's a I'm a tread water. I'm a tread. <laughs> and I'm a spit out the water I swallow. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, man. So it's <laughs>